Okay, guys, go ahead. Take All it. Right. All right. So um, I'm going to start this out with um, you've heard a lot of wonderful talks from uh, esteemed professionals. And Lisa and I are, uh, we are amateurs and enthusiasts. And so we, we want to share with you some, uh, the iNaturalist project, which for us has been a really fun way to connect with bee people and learn about bees. But keep in mind, we're not professionals. So please jump in if you, uh, if you take issue with anything we say. And if you have any suggestions for how we could um, kind of uh, improve improve the community for everybody. Um, oh, Kate, could you please do the first poll? Um, so we, we want to do just this really quick uh, poll to, to figure out how much experience people have with iNaturalist. Are you able to do that while oh. I'm sharing? For some reason, it's saying I can't. Let me work on it and I will interrupt you in a, in a okay. once you get going. It's giving me a little trouble. Give me a second. Okay, no worries. It's not, it's not a big deal. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today, just an introduction to iNaturalist because not everyone will have used it, um, the, the Washington Native Bee Society project on iNaturalist. We're going to give some tips for making good observations and identifications there. Um, and then we're just going to talk about some fun bees. Um, and then we have a bunch of other topics, but we probably don't have time to get to all of them. So we'll let people decide what we, what we do at that point if we have time. All right, first off, what is iNaturalist? Um, it's, it's an online community and software platform where people share and identify photos of organisms. And its goal is so, so that the observations that people post have scientific value, but its main goal is learning and, uh, and sharing uh, about nature. Um, and so the, the, organ, the observations that people post can be identified by anyone else, can be identified by an expert or a complete beginner. And um, when, when it works the best, which is usually the experts really help the beginners learn and the beginners turn into identifiers themselves. And as you can see, there's just really a, an enormous amount of participation. Um, there are multiple community science websites, but I'm pretty sure this is the biggest one by quite a lot. Um, I don't know, maybe eBird rivals it, but, um, but certainly for bees, this is the biggest one. Um, another nice feature is that it has an, an, a computer vision system that can try to automatically recognize something when you, um, when you upload it. Now, it's not perfect, but it's often a good place to start for somebody who doesn't, um, uh, if, you're, if you have no idea what you're looking at. Oh, hey, I see the poll. All right, I'm going to answer the poll and get it off of my screen. And Kate, when you get the results, will you just uh, chime in and tell me what they say? There's a little mix up with, I think you're in charge. So oh. it should say launch it. Uh, I it should have. Wait, and yeah. I, I'm the one who launched it. Kate sent me a note. I didn't Excellent. know I could. Yeah, and you, I can, you, and you and I can end it when you tell me to, and I can see the poll results if you ask me to tell you them. Okay. Get, there's 39 people here. So when you get close to 30 something. Yeah. Yeah. Just jump in. So 14% um, haven't used it. Uh, five, 23% have used it once or twice, but not very comfortable. 43% said, I know the basics and 20% said I'm really good. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. That really helps us target this. Um, all right, so you can access iNaturalist. Oh, I see the results. Very nice. Uh, first time I've done this, sorry. So no worries. It's awesome. Um, so you can access it through its website. That's where you can uh, use the most features. There's also kind of a stripped down smartphone app where you can just make the observations directly in the app. And there's also a Seek app that is very careful about privacy. So it can be used by kids and like kids, classes of kids. Um, but it's also more limited. Um, okay, so what can you do on iNaturalist? Uh, one thing you can do is post your own observations. Um, so you can, uh, you know, you can use computer vision or whatever you want to to try to ID your own observations. And then you can also practice. You can browse other people's identification, other people's observations. You can practice identifying them. You can learn from the identifications other people have made. Um, 
another thing you can do is just connect with people, right? You can, uh, it's a meeting place for everybody from total beginners to experts. And, um, and people are generally open to, uh, to explaining why they're, they make certain identifications and to connecting. And it's it, you can it's also useful for gathering data. Um, so one one thing it does is learning for, learns from your observations. If the observations get enough identifications that it's uh, confident that, uh, that that the edif identification is correct, so that's then it achieves this research grade status, um, and uh, it it gets exported to global biodiversity databases. And it also um, they also use that information to teach the computer vision, and so the computer vision becomes more accurate, and it learns more species. Um, and the data can also address certain types of scientific questions. So um, sometimes you can find an, an observation outside the usual range or outside the usual time of year that a species is identified. Um, and you can also get information about how species interact, which is something that can vary locally. Um, so uh, so there, yeah, there's, there's really, there's so, so much you can do with it. All right, and on iNaturalist, we have a project associated with the Washington Native Bee Society. Um, and a project on iNaturalist is a group of observations. And the way we have set ours is that all bee observations are included except for uh, honeybees. Um, so that does include some invasive species are not all native, but um, it's kind of everything but the huge crush of honeybee observations. Um, you can also join the project and that means that you get updates uh, whenever there is like a blog post that which is on iNaturalist is called a journal entry um, and uh, and th that that appears in your feed on iNaturalist and so the feed it's kind of like a Facebook feed but it's wonderful instead of terrible <laughs> it's a lot of people uh, having like constructive conversations Okay, that was that was her comment about the organisms and the vitriol. And if you stay just in the bee world on Facebook, it's a really nice place to be. Just saying. Okay, I, all right. <laughs> I'll ahead. believe that. Um, okay, and so um, there are there are a few a few places you can click here to to see different aspects of the project. Um, and Lisa is going to tell you a little bit about um, what what you can learn from those. Okay, so observations. Um, we started this, I believe, on October 14th, 2020. Correct me if I'm wrong, Colleen. I did another thing where I took pictures of all of the bees on the, the observations on February 25th. I think we did our first presentation then, and we only had under 3,000 observations and 44 to species. Today we are at, or yeah, did I change that? It's close to this. I, I think it's right. Okay, yeah. 17,822. It changes every moment. So 17,822 observations. So it's grown tremendously. And 147 species isn't quite right. We have, I counted for Chris, for her, she did an article and checked on, we checked on it and it was about 126 or seven. We have a lot to subgenus or a handful to subgenus and then we have some errors. So um, it's, a, it's not an exact science on that number. Okay, so species, that is my favorite place to go on our project. It organizes all the bees that we have, all 17,000, et cetera, into the, I'm pointing to the page, you can't see it, as if I get, ah, sorry. Um, it organizes them so that the most photographed bees, these are not necessarily our most abundant bees, but these are the ones that you see and take pictures of, okay? And then the other thing to note is that those, am I talking loud enough for everybody? Some people can't hear me sometimes. Okay. Um, the pictures that are on the screen right now are the taxon photo pictures. So when you have a really good picture or like a few of ours, um, there were no pictures of Washington bees and David Cappert provided the, the sideways bees that are kind of more scientific looking with a face in the corner. He provided those and I put them on the taxon pages so there was something to look at and maybe if you got anything that looked like that you could try try it for or if it gets identified by an expert then we'd have something for it to go to and match so you can see those ones that have the gray backgrounds there in the middle those are from david capper and he works with susan waters in the puget sound south puget sound meadows and down to the willamette 
uh, it was really funny because he's in Corvallis and he's working side by side with all the bee people. And I finally got him to talk to Link at some point, I guess, because I guess they met. Um, species. Uh, so down at the bottom of the big pile of species, you find these ones that only have one or two observations. So these are our most rarely photog photographed bees right now. Um, if a bee has no taxon photos or no photos, you have to have a hundred uh, CV computer vision photos before the computer vision takes notice. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about that some more. Um, so a bee that has one post doesn't have a hundred possibly, unless they're in some other state somewhere back east also like Halictids or something. Um, so we're going to get better photos. And was it a question, Kate? Yes, there is. And I think okay. it's, it's, I thought it was at least telling me to stop. Go ahead. No, she wasn't. <laughs> if you could, because it's kind of important, um, mm -hmm. says, uh, when I search in Washington Native Bee Society and projects, nothing shows. Can you tell us where to find it or how to pull it up or what's the easiest? Make sure you spelled it correctly. It's Washington space, Native space, Bee space, society, and it's under the projects. Yeah, if you enter that in the search bar, um, sometimes you have to wait a second and for it to pop up. If you have any bees on your page, there should be a logo on each of those pages. If it's a she found it, Kylie found it. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Oh, someone said it. Thanks, Amber. Amber put in a link. Okay, right. continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we 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 um tomorrow is the first meeting of our our first discussion to talk about if we're gonna if and how we're gonna do a Washington State Bee Atlas. So we will need to collect bees in order to identify them, especially the teeny tiny bees and um, the ones that won't be identified well on, in this project, because there's a lot of bees like Osmia where there's just tiny differences and Lazia gossam, which are sent away for DNA. So um, we will have to do a collection too. Next, thank you. Um, on the bottom of, I didn't talk about that up there at the page, but the bottom of the page, there are some lists of people under different categories. Identifiers are them are friends and we want to treat them nicely and have them come back. So be kind to them. Um, sometimes they're very direct. And uh, John Asher has, what did I say, 8,000? He's over 8,000 identifications now. I think that's further down in the thing. So he, if you get anything from him that's more than, than an ID, that's amazing. Be honored and uh, wowed. Uh, People, um, let's see. So John Asher, who is he? He's a, a, I think, assistant professor in Singapore, and he used to work at the American Natural History Museum, Museum of Natural History in New York, whatever it's called. And he is like a, a B version of the Energizer Bunny. I don't know how he gets so much done. Um, please don't automatically agree with IDs. We'll talk about that again later on. And some people just do observations, some people just do IDs, some do both. And there's another thing you can do, um, just adding more detail to observations without doing any of those things. Next. And, and I'll just add that yes. other than John Asher's too busy to respond to, to pings, but most of the rest of the people on this list would be happy to help you if you, if you ping them on one of your observations. So yeah. So m many of them are members of WANOPS. Are there any more questions about our basics? And we will do a, a short survey at the end to see what you'd like to know more about. And uh, I can't see one slide for a second. Say again, Tina. Uh, she did it. Okay, that's all I wanted to see. Oh, go back a second. I guess it ended up up there. The Semi-Social Association of Solitary Bee People, I wanted to mention that. Uh, it was a thing that it was kind of a joke early on and it's on our Instagram as because none of us have met each other yet. <laughs> the biggest group we've had so far in, since we started was um, Joe and Will and David got together to do a, the thing at the field. So that's the most of us. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, and maybe you're going to get to this, another value with iNaturalist is how the Oregon Bee Project and I expect the Washington Bee Project will be getting data both about bees to get you labels, but also to help to help develop the bee plant relationship. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, we yeah. are going to cover that. Okay. Yep. Uh, I forgot whose turn it is here. I, I think it's mine. I think it's yours. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to go through a few tips on making observations and identifications. Um, oh, uh, we lost a slide there, unfortunately, uh -oh. or a couple of slides. I wonder how that happened. Um, okay. You know what? I think I'm going to try to grab those. If Are there any other questions that we could be um, yeah, addressing? There's a, there's a question about photography. How do you, they choose from the photos to use for the bees? Um, and are you talking about taxon photos? Is that Tina? Hello. And then do most of the photographers use cameras with macro lenses or smartphones? Uh, that's another topic altogether. We didn't talk about photography. Uh, I use both. I have a macro lens and I use my phone. I love the phone because it has lat long. And when I do the um, Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas, I need to put that in the data in the Bumblebee watch. So that way I always have a location. Then I often take a picture with my real camera and then try to remember which ones go together <laughs> and get them back together. So nope, we're starting over. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry about that. I'm um, I'm not sure where those went, but I'll just I'll just say, state a couple of things um, uh, uh, verbally. Um, so the like the basic unit in iNaturalist is an observation, and an observation is of one organism. Um, so like if you have a bee on a flower and you want to take note of both of them, you need two separate observations. Um, and so you just, if your pictures have both in, you should just write in the comments, I mean this observation for the bee or this for the flower. Um, and it's good to take- have one of each if you can. Yeah, and and if one of the things is, is um, captive or cultivated, like if it's a plant in your garden or a bee from a hive that you keep, then there's a, a box you should check to mark that so that people know it's not wild. Um, and it, but it is good to have multiple, you can put multiple photos in an observation. And that's a really good thing to do um, uh, because that helps get, that helps get um, more information that will help with the identification. Um, so here, for example, you know, you can see a little bit around the mandibles there. You can see the legs. Here's like a close up of one of the legs. You can see the butt um, using very scientific terms here, but, and you can also often with bees, it's really helpful to be able to see the pattern of wing veins. So um, you're most likely to get good quality ID if you've got a, if you've got a, a nice smorgasbord like this, but even if you just have one blurry photo, it is amazing what people can do. Um, I've had some ridiculous things identified by experts. Um, and let's see, are you taking over now, Lisa? Oh, sorry, I'm typing to Tony. Okay, there we go. I guess I could answer those questions. Uh, Karen Kerstetter, Kerstetter sorry. Um, she wanted to know if native plants in her garden are considered cultivated. I have that problem too. Um, the ones that volunteer are not, but the ones that you bought and put in the ground are cultivated because they didn't come up naturally. I have native plants that aren't necessarily from right in my yard. Um, yeah. A it, different kind that wouldn't be here normally. I think it depends. It's, then, yeah, it's a tricky line. It's like, it's not, it, there are cases that are kind of borderline that are hard to call, but then, just do your best. And then Tony wants to know if he can add his observations past and future to the project. You don't have to add anything. It should show up if it's a bee. We gathered all the things except for the honeybees. So yeah, it automatically does it. As long as you're inside Washington state. Okay, so you can add more details to observations. Here's the thing that anybody can do. You, even if they never post a photograph or identify a bee or a flower or anything else. Um, if you go down, I still can't read this. Um, if you go down to the right-hand side of your observation page, there's alive or dead. Most of the time the bees are alive. Um, evidence of presence. Then up here on the right, there's that other little pop-up box over there. Gall, molt, organism, scat and track. We're just gonna say it's an organism most of the time you're not going to see baby bees very often unless you break open um, a colony or a hive or a hotel, bee hotel or something. Um, life stage, it's usually a, an adult. And baby bees are larvae. People always see little bees and they go, oh, what a cute little baby bee. And it's not going to grow up and get any bigger. It's going to, that's life size. And then sex, if you can tell if it's a boy or a girl. And we're going to have that here somewhere. Um, 
flowers go with bees and bees go with flowers. And the more we can connect those two things, the better our data is gonna be. So if you go to the observation field, which is below where we just were on the side of your page, and there's a little pop-up thing, if this will change, it'll have different things in it depending upon what you've been doing. So associated species with names lookup is the one we prefer that you use. There's also the name of the associated plant um, this one, people can go in and change. So if you do the name of the associated plant and you get it wrong, they have to talk to you and talk you into fixing it. This uh, names lookup is changeable. So I started typing in nine bark and all these things showed up. Most of them are not plants. So if you do a generic name like rabbit brushes with an S, nine barks with an S or um, buckwheats with an S, that is like the, I don't know what level it is, family or tribe, it's above. The it depends. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it, may, it makes a difference where you're at. Anyway, it'll give you a more generic name. So yeah, and just click carpets. click on the one that you like. Like click on the one that is what you want. Yeah. So I did nine barks because I don't know which kind of nine bark it is. I think it's a nine bark. I'm not even 100% sure of that. Okay. I think, is there anything? Okay. So then from OBA, uh, they ask us to take three pictures in particular. One of the flowers one of the way the leaves are. So if they're um, alternating across from each other on the stem, if they're staggered down the stem, if it's a whorl at the bottom, um, whatever else leaves come in. So show, I didn't really, there wasn't room to put everything in here, but um, show the, the way the leaves work. Or, or you can be Atlas. I keep saying the other thing, I'm sorry. Um, details of the plant, especially those darn yellow composites um, Ellen Watros down there suggested that we take the backs of the flowers where the sepals and the, um, all that stuff. There's bracts back there that are really important. So if you've eaten an artichoke, you've eaten bracts. Those are really important to aster family plants. And then if you can throw in a habitat shot, that helps too. We've got such a variety of habitats in the Northwest. It's not all the same. So um, very helpful for the bees. Notice I had one, oops, excuse me, go back. There's oh. one bee that snuck into that picture. And um, so I would have written observation for the plant, not the bee or something like that on my notes when I posted it or underneath in the comments, either one. And just to be super clear, this slide, it's about adding, this is a field observation field on the bee observation saying, hey, this bee was on this flower. And then this is actually a separate observation for the plant. And doing both of those is, is a really good thing to do. And there's another one where you can put the URL from the plant on the bee. You only have to go one way on that. That's right, to link those one. two observations together. So there's all different ways, ways to connect these. Okay, so I just- Lisa, that... quick question. Yes? Is the mobile app the same as the laptop app? No. It, okay. You can't do all these things in the mobile app. You can there's a little discussion on that. You can look up the projects, but I don't know. I haven't really tried to do anything from there. I've tried to okay. go in and do stuff, and most of it's pretty limited. It's pretty limited, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, Mr. Buggy Bobby and I met this week, and he started telling me about observing. I think he's got an Andrina colony or aggregation, excuse me. And um, he said that they were climbing up the grass to sun, and he noticed that all the daisies had crab spiders on them. So the yellow spiders with the big long legs that grab bees and dot, kill them. And he was wondering if the, the bees were evolving to prefer grass over the daisies for warming up in the morning. Um, so he wrote me this, I mean, we have this big long chain of emails already. And I said, you need, it's really neat. You should tell that story. So he started doing some blogging and just adding. I a I was the on, one that wrote that to you. You were? I am. You are. Oh, I, are. I didn't connect you. Um, Hi. <laughs> hello. So I've, I love I've done a lot more looking and a lot more thinking down there. And I think it has to do with the grass shading the, um, the daisy. grass shading the um, aggregation in the early spring. Okay. And that they're, they're climbing the grass to get earlier access to sun on their flight muscles so that they can swarm. And get warm. Yeah, that's awesome. So you can write a note when you post your thing, you can write a note in the comments or you can write a journal thing if it's a big long story that's too big for those other places. And the other thing that I like about your um, post is you figured out to put the links to the videos because we can't yet put videos into INAT. So that's a way to connect them to the, the bees in the story. Awesome job, thank you. Nice thank to meet you. you. Journal entries are great if you, have, if you wanna talk about multiple observations. Mm -hmm. You can have links to all of them. 
and I've I get I've gotten really cool feedback on journal entries. So just a fun way to start a conversation. Um, you all right, because I go off track. Really. Okay. <laughs> yes. And so right. So when you upload an observation, one thing you want to do is is identify it. And you might not know what it is, but you want to put something in. Um, you can be be as specific as you can, um, but it might just be insects, or you might know it all the way to species. Um, and the computer vision will suggest IDs and it'll say things like, we're pretty sure this is in the genus, but be really skeptical. Um, Lisa, what was your anecdote? Oh, so the back end of a bee that was hanging down like this, can you think of something that would be dark and shaped sort of like that? It was an elephant seal. <laughs> <laughs> That's what computer vision thought. So take it with a grain of salt. I, I, I still laugh. Okay. <laughs> But um, you can, uh, the, the nice thing is that you can just look at other observations of that species of, you know, you can go one level up and look at, look at other species in that genus, et cetera, et cetera, and, and kind of get a sense of how fine grained to go. Um, View and the taxon pages, how to get to, to those. Yeah. When, when, it, when you, when the computer vision tells you something up in the corner, it'll say view like it does here on the, on the side of those. And you can go to that taxon page and look at the bees there and see if they look like what you you were told it might be. Um, okay, I, I all right. That and, part about Easter and, bees. and so um, that those were just some tips for the first idea on your own observations. But if you're going out to identify other people, well, actually the first one. Uh, um, applies to your own as well. So like I think Lisa mentioned, if, if you put an ID on and someone else IDs it more specifically, um, don't hit the agree button unless you independently check and you know rule out the other possibilities. It's not a um, like, it's not. It's not yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a like button. You can say thank you if you wanna thank the person um, uh, because you don't want it to accidentally be, make research great if that person is mistaken. Um, but so on your own or others' observations, um, just be uh, just be really uh, courteous and kind, and remember that you might be the one who's wrong. Um, a naturalist also shows you the uh, you can look at the range at the geographical range for the species you're interested in, and it shows a little plot of of which months um, it's mostly seen in. So you can look at those too, and it's really great to um, explain your reasoning. Um, to help other people learn and to explain any jargon you use um, so that you bring other people along and then they can they can do the identification themselves next time. Because we need a lot more identifiers. Um, this one's mine, right? CVs, yes. um, the agree. So we have algal chlorine, algal chlora, algal chlorella, algal chlora, blah, 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 um, showing up. I think what happens is the computer vision has a lot easier time identifying bees back east, east of the Mississippi, east of the Rocky, Rocky Mountains. And uh, so it tries to name our bees with those names. The Western bees are more diverse. Washington State has maybe 600, possibly 700 bees. And the little, the, the whole state park, uh, is it a national park or wilderness area of Staircase and Escalante, that has over 600 bees in that one small area. So they're much more diverse here and they're much less represented online. So it's just doing the best with what it's got to work with, but it's wrong. So I have to go in and fix those. One thing you can tell, it has a notch. You can see that the front of the B has a, a divot or a V on the eye, which is more of a wasp characteristic normally. And then our egg opossum, and you're not gonna see this in the photo very well, um, has a carina. I borrowed this from um, the Willamette Bees, which is a very good, uh, photography oriented guide to the that you can use especially on the west side of Washington and Oregon but it works great over here too disagree agreeably so uh, John Asher is not averse to being disagreed with but he'll be sort of short answer kind of person very direct and he'll come by really fast and go zoom zoom and he leaves so uh, he identified this as a bombus perplexus and I thought that can't be. And I looked it up and the range, you can see we have one little perplexus in Washington, but they are north of us, unless they're also misidentified bees. <laughs> um, uh, so it might be possible up on our Northern border that we would actually have some of these. 
I don't think it's one. The one at the top is the B that was posted and the one on the bottom is the taxon photo. So I just wrote a note that there's only one enter entry in our state and um, we'll see what happens. Um, oh, do you, you, you wanna pass it back to me? Yeah. Yeah, so this is just a fun example of the process of figuring it out. So um, I saw this B and I had never seen anything like it before. Um, and computer vision suggested it was in the tri of Anthophorini, um, but I couldn't tell whether it was Anthophora or Hebrapoda or Hebrapoda, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, and so a, um, I think he might be a grad student uh, in entomology. In Trevor Sless, and he used yeah, to be out here and he moved back east. So I think he's doing something with bees somewhere, probably a university, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, so he pointed out that um, you could distinguish those two genera with the with the wing vein pattern and pointed us to um, to a link to tell the difference. So here's the um, there's this this Y shape in Anthophora wings and um, the and then it's a more of a cross for um, Haverpoda. And uh, so then I was able to get photos of that and verify that it was it's Anthophora. And then John Asher saw it and said, it looks like Pacifica from these leg fringes. So that's um, the CF thing. Yes, and then eventually I found a dead one and gave it to a, a Wanabs person with a microscope and a lot of experience who, who keyed it out and it, it, it was indeed Anthophora Pacifica. So these are just the kind of fun conversations that you can have, especially when you explain your reasoning. And now we know and can uh, help other people. And, and, and wait, go back. The blurry photo is important, even though it's not very good because it shows the back end of the bee. You can see it's kind of shiny. It's not hairy and it has some white fringes. You can at least see that much. And that might be important. We don't know what we need for D, um, BID. So try to include everything. You're doing this one still? Uh, sure, yeah. And so J John Asher has pointed out to us that in some cases, um, you know, computer vision will suggest seratina, but in our uh, locality, they're all Zodontomeris, um, and that's also true for some of these other bees, um, that they're all in a specific subgenus. So if you don't recognize the name, and you know Serotina, Tina, whatever, and um, what the heck is that Zodontomeris, then that's where that's coming from. Um, we don't collect these, so they're not showing up in our project. Yeah, yeah, but but there are tons of honeybees on iNaturalist, and um, when other people, the the experts do ID them, um, but they spend time IDing them that they could be using for the trickier bees. So um, for somebody who's a relative beginner at IDing, if you get really good at IDing honeybees, that's a way you can help out. Um, and here's a link to uh, uh, some really nice tips about using the wing veins. Um, and then there are some other identifying features like the their leg shape is pretty unique. And the fact that they have pollen baskets um, is also pretty hairy unique. Eyes. Don, Here, Don right. is my, my mentor and he likes to tell people, well, it has hairy eyes, can't you tell? And <laughs> kind of pull their legs, but you can see it if the light's right, you really can. Okay, can, I'm going to jump in. The wait, go yeah. back for a sec. The the reason I had to learn honeybees, I was totally ignoring them. But the reason I had to learn them was because uh, um, bees like these two, the Halictus rubicundus and Andrina prunorum, who have a sort of honeybee like coloring. Coloring, they're a little smaller, but um, I kept seeing these things that weren't honeybees, but I didn't know what they were, and so I had to rule out honeybees by knowing what they looked like. Okay. The, the golden color on the integument, that's another very honeybee thing, um, although it's not present on all honeybees. Some honeybees are really very dark. That's the kind I have. Um, and uh, so here's a case study of some difficult to distinguish bees that we were talking about in the bee share, um, Bombus vasosetskii and Bombus collagenosus. And um, so there's uh, uh, you know, there's this, there's this mimicry that bumblebees are notorious for. Sometimes not, it's not the most closely related bees even that look the most alike. Um, and so when possible, we should ID them to species, but for many photos, it's not possible to distinguish them. So all you can do on iNaturalist is 
um, listed as pyro subgenus pyrobombus. But there are like 30 species in subgenus pyrobombus, and it would be awfully nice to have more uh, specific information recorded. Um, so we created, you can create your own observation field, and we created one, uh, one called pyrobombus where you can select the Bosnesenskii collagenosis. And so you will know that it's one of those two. Um, but for if you, uh, but you should, but you should also look for characters that would allow you to identify them all, all the way to species. Um, one of these characteristics is these uh, these yellow hairs that um, at least I think most collagenosis have, and most most female collagenosis have, and most female Bosnienski I don't have. I don't know that it's a hundred percent in either direction. I'm sure some of the experts here would <laughs> would know that. Um, and then, um, and then they also have different facial proportions. Um, so that's a that's another way. And if you can get them under a microscope, the males have different genitalia. But um, but for the the rest of us who uh, who don't have who who don't can't judge these proportions, yeah. you can use that observation field. Okay, the range map. So this is from the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas, and I drew some lines, kind of except for the one by Umpo went out when it should have gone in. Uh, Caligenosis on the bumblebee watch is on the left of the red line in the, pic the, the map to the right-hand side with the arrows pointing in. And that's where they've been found. We only have 76 on iNaturalist. Bumblebee watch is um, a little stronger maybe in the bee world for bumblebees. Um, you can see in the top of the left photo that the the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas focused on Washington, Oregon, and apparently there weren't any in Idaho, so they didn't show up there. And California has just started their own bumblebee um, bat atlas, so they will probably fill that up pretty soon. So I think it's safe to say that you're only going to have to worry about the pyrobombus part of Vosnesenskii on the left side of the um, inside of the Cascade Range. I would give it some space. So once you get over to the east side where it's drier, you're probably not going to find caligenosis. So you could probably safely call all of the ones on our side, my side, <laughs> you can call those Bivas and Sensky. Um, and then we have one more that turns up a lot. This is Ternarius, which if you look at my range map down there, it is also north in Canada. Uh, on the side, it looks exactly like our Hunt's bumblebee. Hunt's bumblebees will be a lot. What, Joe, do you see them at all on the West Coast or just very rarely? Uh, Hunt's bumblebee is not on the west of the mountains. Not, not on the west. Only, okay. only east, yeah. Yeah, so um, the thing that's different about them, if you look at the bottom, you can see they have what I call the Batman shield kind of shape that divides the, the, the hunts are straight. And then the one down below, you can see it, the, it, the black divides the two tufts of yellow on the back of the scutellum back there on the thorax. The, if you saw only the top of the bee, it's more like um, the Vancouver bumblebees on the right. You, if you look at the tail end of that bee, you can see that the pattern is completely different, which is why we want to see the abdomen whenever the wings aren't in the way, uh, black, orange, or red. They call it red. It's like red-headed people. It's red and then yellow in bumblebees. So um, if you could only see the face and the shoulders, you might mix those up. So I'm kicking those out of the, the species all the time. And then- Yeah, but you, but you can put them in the, you can't yeah. use the pyrobombus observation field. Yes, and, and the, van, the whole bifarious thing is a whole nother program. So we'll just let that lie. Pyrobombus um, can be used uh, also on impatience. So we had uh, tomato farmers with greenhouses up in Canada and they escaped and they are moving south just like the Asian hornet. Uh, they are not as dangerous as the Asian hornet or as scary. Um, but they do have large colonies. They can have up to 500 workers. So that gives them a big advantage. And I've noticed on Lori's post that there's a lot of them in Vancouver. It seems like they've, are, are they, would you say there's more than any of the other bumblebees? Um, not yet, but uh, they are definitely increasing and uh, we're getting more and more observations. Um, so yeah, it's, it would be good to track them. 
Yeah. So that's, it's really simple to see. You can see the whole back, the whole back of the bee is yellow. There's no black spot. There might be a little grayish area there, but there's no black spot and there's no black bar from wing to wing. And then they only have one bar of yellow on the top. Uh, our closest bee, I think the only one that was mistaken probably was a, there's yellow bee Griziocalus that looked pretty filled in, but they would have a patch of, of brown on T2, a little, or yellow, the little scallop, like a fanny pack. And maybe Vegans, the... Uh, oh, right, uh, Vegans, Vegans. But, yeah. but that's a lot smaller, typically. So, and it's so far on the east side of the mountains, and we haven't seen a patient. We've only seen a patient on the west side. Oh, and David was one of the first people to find them at the at the Pacific P, or at the Peace Arch where you cross into Canada and cross into America. So they came through the, the proper channels. <laughs> right by border crossing. Okay. Um, pause for more questions. Okay, so we're going to talk about some bees. Uh, longhorn bees are going to be one you can probably safely identify. They have really long antenna. They're not horns. And um, males, you. Males, yes, just males. And the, the usura are the ones that are out now, the spring um, longhorn bees. And the, if, the, down in the left corner, there's one that has black antenna and a yellow clypus. I can't say that word. It's not a nose, <laughs> but it's on its front, front of its face, the lower half of its face. And any of those you can safely put to um, subgenus Sinhalonia. I had looked through um, iNaturalist and it seemed to me that the um, Usura were overlapping with Melisodes for two weeks in the first of July. This year, they might be later just because of the weird weather we're having. Um, so you have to go back and forth. So that makes it harder to do the females because the, the, um, they should be out kind of together. And then after July, Melisodes are like the ones in the um, picture here and they are kind of caramel or brown and they're lighter on the bottom and darker on the top usually. Is, is that true for all Melisodes? Link, are you still here? He went to Could school. you repeat that? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, are all the Melisodes uh, antennae this color? Um, no, so um, frequently Melisodes have kind of two-toned antennae, either yellowish, orangish, or reddish on one side, and then darker, dark brown, black on the other side. But some species, um, including hmm, Melisodes rivalis, a thistle bee, Melisodes microsticta, a really common West Coast species, um, and maybe in the interior, Melisodes confusus maybe is there, and they all have mostly entirely dark antennae. So it usually works to distinguish Usura and Melisodes, but not in some cases. However, those cases would be limited to later in the summer, which is another tip that it's a, a Melisodes. Thank you. You're welcome. And Lisa, I should just point out, we it looks like there are 10 minutes to 8.30. Um, and we should okay. probably leave some time for questions too. Okay. So I don't know if we want to go a little faster or skip something. So these are really easy to find. Their generalist bees are all over the place. They're sparkly green and very pretty. Uh, the yellow and black tail means it's, or yellow and brown tail means it's a male. And we have the ones on the left that have the Arnold Schwarzenegger bice, or uh, femurs. So with femurs, not legs, arms, um, big beefy arms or legs, excuse me. And um, those are femoratus. I think those tend to be on my side of the mountains over here in the east. And most of our other ones end up as in Texanus. I think there's some problems with that for a future program. Okay. And the females are all pretty green. Up in the left, these ones are a little bit chunky looking. We think they're generally kind of a more lanky looking bee. So these are odd the angle or something is messing with them, but they are black and you can see that the edges have hairs. And um, so those are not colored bands of integument or skin or exoskeleton or whatever you want to call it. Here are the males with the colored integument and they the females like with, painted the with fingernail hairs. polish. So the, that one with the black with a white edge is one anybody can name Virisons and it's a female. Um, the others are solid green and um, We'll work on the rest of this on another day. The osmias are our other metallic bees, but they're chunky. 
their bodies are round like beads and um, big heads. So they're not gonna, they shouldn't be con too confusing once you've seen a couple of them. Nomia melandrae is our, one of, I think our prettiest bee. It has uh, opalescent bands, but you will only probably find them around Tushi unless you go walking around in dried up vernal pools. If you find one, let me know, I wanna find them. And they did have their own speed limit. Uh, Spastra is a bee that is in the Yakima and uh, Othello area. It's chunky, it has big legs, and the spatulate hairs are one of the ID things, but that would be something you would look under a microscope to see. And Nomada are our wasp like bees. We had one in the bee share. The red ones might be easier just because we have fewer red wasps and they are smaller than um, honeybees. And the they have kind of chunkier um, antenna, but they don't have big chunky legs like a lot of our bees. So they're, they do look very wasp-like. And under a microscope, you can see plumose hairs, which are hairs that have branches like uh, feathery kind of hairs instead of shiny pointy hairs like an eyelash. And it's also, if you see one of these and you don't know, you can just mark it as, you know, bees, Hymenoptera or bees and apoid wasps and somebody will Somebody will, will get to it. And then those are, there's cuckoo bees and this stelis um, is just about not having scopa. So scopa is the thing that carries pollen. So it doesn't have hairy legs. And in this case, it doesn't have hair under the body like the mega Kylie down there. I couldn't find a good osmia type um, bee that the hair showed well. Uh, cuckoo bees are going to go lay eggs in other bees nests and take the day off. They're not gathering pollen. And so uh, we have lots of interesting cuckoo bees to learn about another program. There's one more coming up, a really pretty one. And, and I think, so we have a few other sections that we could do, but I think that we don't, we're not really gonna have time to make those part of the main program. Um, Elise, uh, yeah. can I interrupt? So can you clarify, I know there was a question earlier, how to add an observation to our group, clarify the fact that it's not really something you would have to do, it's automatic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you make an observation of a bee in Washington and it is labeled as a bee or anything more specific, it will automatically be included in the Washington Native Bee Society project. In addition, you can become a member of the project in iNaturalist. And that means that when there's like a journal entry, so like a blog post, it'll show up in your feed. Um, but those are kind of two separate things. You, you're, if you, if you have, if you're observing bees in Washington, your bees are going into our project, whether you like it or not, <laughs> if you're putting them in a naturalist. Because when we set it up, we set it up with um, borders and the borders were the state of Washington. You can do this on a smaller scale if you just wanna know, I'm not sure how small it'll go, but you know, if you wanted to know if, how many bees you found in your backyard, maybe it'll go that small? I, I think so, yeah. I think uh, you, so can... you could create your own personal project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Donna yeah. Lucas down in um, Tri-Cities did a smaller one around the Richland area, and I've got to get with her and find out how she did that. And yeah, and there are ways you can draw borders of different, you know, with all kinds of crazy shapes. So you can, yeah, you can make your own project. Um, and there are also projects where you add things manually, and there are projects that you can just set the criteria and they automatically load the observations in. And people come and find you when you do something that they want in their project also. And then Tony, adding old things, if you put in old pictures, iNaturalist is perfectly happy with that. Um, and they should also come up on their own. So I think what about have, when, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, somebody have, might have had their hand up a few minutes ago. T Tony uh, has his hand up. Yeah, um, I, it's, it's related to uh, adding the project. So if you're part of a uh, more than one project, is it going to automatically add to the to the other projects too or mm -hmm. okay. it depends it depends on what kind of project it is if that one is the the type that autom that automatically collects observations of certain types then it will get automatically added to that one too but there are collections where people where the 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 people who run the project have to add them manually um or so it would depend on which type of project it is yeah you can join them and type them in yourself in the um is it the observation field? No, that's a, there's a projects one down there too. Yeah. Like like we we have a couple at the bottom of this pile. We can pull one up. I think it's it's dependent on how the project's set up. So if they're automatically set to like the Washington one will take all the bees. 
like I'm in a bird group that I have to add each bird that I'm, I'm doing. But then I'm also in another bird group where it just takes the birds and I don't have to upload them. So it's totally dependent on the project. Okay. Are you Bob or are you KS9? What do we call you? Kevin. Kevin. That's <laughs> Kevin. Okay, Bob's my Kevin middle name. Question. Go, go um, I'm just wondering what happens with obscured location data. Are you seeing the obscured location data as real data? Mm -hmm. Um, well, so, so when you join a project, um, uh, you can, so, okay, in general, if you, so, okay, I should take a step back for people who don't know about this. So when you make an observation, you put in the location and, um, you can say how, how accurate the location is. So you can make it on, you know, one house, or you can make a big circle around the state of Washington. There's something else you can do called obscuring. And that means that you make the location very precise in the observation. So when you look at your own observation, you can see exactly where you did it. But if anyone else looks at it, all they see is a square about the size of, like a rectangle about the size of Seattle. And they know it's somewhere in there. Um, so uh, for, you know, if, if privacy is a concern, you, you obscure, you can obscure the coordinates and, endangered species are automatically obscured. Um, and so um, you can you can choose to, if you have obscured observations, you can choose to share the exact coordinates with the project leads, but that's your choice. Um, you can, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, default is to not do that. And on the cactus, I didn't even know that was happening. I had some cactus and that's how I met Ron Bob Goldman who got to talk to Joe about cactus. Uh, he wrote me to find out where they were. Um, more questions? Did, did we answer all the questions in the chat? Okay. Uh, why don't we jump down to the projects and just show them those really quick? Because we got sure. six minutes. Yeah, there and there are a lot of there are a lot of other cool things you can do on iNaturalist, and we're happy to talk with you about them. Um, but okay. here are some fun projects. I love these sleepy bee slumber parties. I have trouble remembering the names of this one, but um, you can, if you see male bees sleeping outside, male bees don't have a home to go to at night. So they uh, cuddle up on a leaf and clamp their jaws on it and just hang there, hang out. So that's- This, is, this is one where you manually add your observation. And you can do that to other people's pages too. Mm -hmm. Nesting bees, um, bee hotels are kind of obvious, but if you, I would rather see like the one on the top right, the Melipona one the really interesting things that bees do. Our resin bees use sand and they build like little chimneys, but they're, they're, they're little pots for their babies and they're stuck to branches. And that'd be something to find. Bees concentrating nectar. Who Did you say you found one of those today? Or yeah, something? yeah. I found one of those earlier this week. So my, I'm, I'm thinking it's a lot of hyleas and hyleas carry their food home in their crop. They're little black bees with a tiny amount of yellow on their knees or they're not really knees, but the joints and the plates of their faces. And but I think I think other types of bees do that too. That one's not one. Um, the green um, bee on the left isn't, but there's a lot of hyleas that do this. I think probably carrying water is heavy and they want to make food for their babies. So they want to get it to just the right concentration that the babies can use the larvae and mating bees. We already had some of those. So, and, yeah. and this, those were all Zach Portman's. He's a I believe a taxonomist in either Michigan or Minnesota, I mix them up uh, back in the Midwest. And uh, Mega Kylie B. Leaf Cuts is somebody from the same university. And I noticed that all they had was leaves and all I had was flowers being cut. So I wrote them and said, can I add those too? And they said, sure. So that's my silver tail petal cutter there, which is a very fun bee. Okay. Yeah, so those are just kind of some of the fun things you can do and you can start your own if you want. Another um, program. And sorry, um, so um, what, Kate or David, would it be possible to do the, the neck, the last poll? Um, because we could have work, we could have workshops on, like we could have an introduction to iNaturalist workshop where we just help people make their, there we go, I see the poll up here. Um, we can help people make their first observations um, we could also go into some of those advanced features that we didn't get to here. And I think that there's going to be interest in the taking and editing photos. They probably could vote for more than one. 
Yes, right. For this one, pick any all any and all that you're interested in. And we'll use that for some time in the winter when we can't find a regular speaker, maybe, unless we go out on a field trip. In which case, we could do this like the night before and then do the, the out in the field the next day. Works really well. And then I want to point out that Lisa's really used it as a social media you know, aspect. Um, it's, you know, we talked, they, Elise talked about that earlier where you can, you know, converse back and forth with people and it is friendly um, and it will help you maybe meet other B people um, outside of just us. So it's, it's kind of a nice little safe place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to mention that I met a guy on Twitter that's from Washington and made a connection with him and he started putting his bees on your project and then you know he saw blue orchard mason bee in his garden he was like oh that's the first time i've seen that what can i plant to attract more of them and so there's this really nice interaction that happens so i really enjoyed that i also want to say that another thing you can do if you see an observation that you really like you can put it as a favorite and then what happens is you can actually in your comments you'll see um, who IDs the bee in the conversations that happen around that actual observation. And so that's how you can keep track of uh, Lisa's interaction with John Asher. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, you know, it's like these little um, mini plays that, that play themselves out. It's and really so that's amazing really... if he ever comes back, it's like magic. <laughs> that's a good feature too. So if you favorite something, it creates this really nice page of all your favorites. And then you can also keep track of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you can follow people too, to if you want to see everything that somebody posts. And if you're good at, at, at IDing bees, go up in Canada and, and pay Lori back for coming down and helping us. <laughs> and Lincoln, Oregon. They don't put as many bee post pictures up down there. They're too busy collecting them. But you know, the good news is that we hope to be hiring a bee taxonomist through the Washington State Department of Agriculture uh, money is available July, and we hope to have someone on board by early fall. Yay. Oh, that's big news. It's great. Yeah. I think we're done. Thanks, all.